Hello. Hi, everyone. I hope you're all doing great. Um, we'll usually we'll just give a minute or two to uh, have everyone joining us. I can see people are joining in. Thank you so much for being on time. Um, so for those of you already online, um, it's just unusual, uh, you know, the housekeeping stuff. Um, please use the Q&A panel for any questions you might have. And please do use the chat uh, window for any um anything that you want to discuss about the topic. Um, and um, also please do type in uh, hello uh, to our uh, speaker today and also which country that you're coming in from. So it'll be quite nice for us to see which part of the world that you're coming in from. So uh, we have a very special guest today and um, none other than Bas Tajikstra. How are you, Bas? Hey, Manoj. Thank you so much for having me. I'm doing great. Really Amazing. looking forward to the session. Yeah. Absolutely. It's it's a very um, key topic, given that is an advent of a lot of modern technologies that's, you know, booming up in the digital space. Digital transformation is the need of the hour. And with such, you know, tightly connected and a lot of uh, granular, you know, sort of services that people go into to develop such independent services. You know, it's going to be a, a very interesting topic that I'm looking forward to here because usually it's all about you know, pack-based testing um, in, in the contract world. But uh, I think um, Bas will touch upon a little bit of that. And also um, the title is very interesting because it says solving the integration testing puzzle with contract testing. So that itself, you know, brings up the curiosity to all the listeners out here. And uh, with no further ado, I'll actually um, let Bas take over. Uh, and um, yeah, stage is yours. Awesome. Thank you so much. Can you, before you mute yourself, Manoj, quickly confirm that you can see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Awesome. Met Metric awesome. Steve? <laughs> um, this is actually what the monitor of the very first PC that I bought would look like. That tells you a little bit about my age, probably, but... Uh... No, it, it's it's <laughs> it looks this cool. is what this is what I looked like when I first started working with computers. This is what the world looks looked like. We also had things like floppy disks and no internet, which is yes, there was a time yeah. before the internet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure people still use this theme in the Mac terminals, so we feel like you know we are nerdy. It's <laughs> it's it's all also a pretty pathetic attempt to make me look cool. But no, it's just, it's actually very easy on the eyes as well. So um, it helps me and, and, and it's recognizable. So yeah. Um, anyway, uh, thank you so much for that introduction, Manoj. Um, I'm Bas. I'm a test automation consultant, engineer training, depending on the day, depending on what time of day it is. Uh, from the Netherlands. And today I want to talk to you about... Uh, contract testing as a way to what Manoj already said, um, solving the integration testing puzzle, solving the challenges that we have in modern, in testing and in performing integration and end-to-end -end testing in modern distributed systems. Um, first of all, a this is maybe the most important slide of all of them. Um, Contract testing is something you do next to your functional API testing. So you should not see contract testing as a replacement for the testing that you do with, for example, libraries like rest assured or requests or tools like Postman or Karate or whatever API testing tool it is that you use. So um, contract testing is not a replacement for that type of testing. It's meant to be a replacement for the integration and end-to-end -end testing you do, for example, with tools like Selenium or Cypress or Playwright or those kinds of libraries and tools. Um, so as Manoj already said, um, there's a lot of people working on developing testing, running distributed systems, even microservices-based systems, although microservices is it's a little bit of a hype word maybe everybody's doing microservices these days um i prefer talking about distributed software systems because and also because contract testing is a technique that's potentially very useful even if you don't do what people like to call microservices um because 
And we all do distributed software development. And we as testers, test engineers, uh, and that means we need to do a lot of integration and end-to-end -end testing. Um, and the most important question, I think, with integration end-to-end -end testing is this one. Are all individual components and services in our system able to communicate with one another? So these components and services are typically built in separate teams, separate organizations, maybe even on separate continents sometimes. Um, and teams are typically pretty capable of testing those individual components and services uh, with tools like uh, what I mentioned earlier, rest assured requests, Postman, Karate, whatever. Um, and that's all well and good, but that's the fact that all of these services and components work well in isolation doesn't mean that they also work well when you put them all together. And when you try to have those components and services communicate with one another. So, for example, let's say, and that's also uh, the context of the code base that I'm going to show you in the live demo part of this session, is let's say we have a provider service uh, that manages addresses, address data. Um, the team that's responsible for... Um, developing, testing, and running the services at the address team, uh, they probably do, they hopefully, they do test their work. They do test their stuff again with tools like Postman or Karate or libraries like Rest Assured or Requests. Um, that means that they, they will test this against their own version their own interpretation of the specifications or of the contract they verify that the thing that they built the service that they built functions according to works according to the behavior that they expect against their interpretation of what good looks like um but it's not that team themselves that is the consumer of this service, the consumer, the user of this product. That can, for example, be um, a different service, a component, for example, a service that uh, manages orders uh, because orders have addresses. Um, a customer also has an address. So maybe, for example, for the customer, it's a billing address and for the order, it's a delivery address. Um, so both the order and the customer consumer service or component, and those components can be other services, they can be front ends, they can be pretty much everything really. Um, they will both consume this address and they will each have their own expectations about how this provider service works. Um, and of course, as with all systems, there can be differences between expected behavior an actual behavior. Uh, just a couple of quick examples. Maybe the consumers expect uh, responses uh, when I retrieve address data. Uh, I expect the response to have a field type with value delivery, but the address provider doesn't, uh, doesn't return that in some specific situation. Or maybe they expect delivery, but what it returns is delivery, just format it a little bit differently. Um, dates and times, always um, a brilliant source of interesting behavior. So maybe uh, the consumers expect a date and time stamp to be formatted like this, but the provider returns it like this. Um, and or, and. Uh, what I think contract testing is particularly good at is discovering um, what, you call what I call conflicts of interest. So maybe the order consumer for a specific operation expects an HTTP 200 as the response status code, but the customer consumer expects a 201 in the exact same situation. Or maybe the order consumer expects a date to be returned in this format, whereas the customer consumer expects it in at the same date, but in a different format. Um, so traditionally, we've tried to uncover these 
defects and try to test and try to find an answer to that question of are all these individual components as services able to talk to one another? Um, so the traditional approach to testing that was, is the everything at once. So if we have four components, A, B, C, and D, stick them all into, um, deploy them all into some testing environment, configure them, make them work together and test them as a single system. Um, but the more distributed your system becomes, the more distributed your environment becomes, the more difficult this gets. Um, I've seen people whose, or even entire teams, whose entire job it is to configure and manage test environments. And to me, that sounds like a an awful job, actually. Uh, no offense to those of you in the audience who actually are doing that job right now, <laughs> but that sounds like a pretty cool horrible task. Eh? Just coordinating us, eh? because again, eh, these components are developed across different teams, different departments, maybe even different organizations. Um, so, and and each of these teams have their own development and deployment life cycle. So, coordinating all of that is a Herculean task. Really. Uh, but this is what how we uh, until fairly recently we have approached uh, that problem of uh, finding the answer to the question or if, uh, whether or not all of these individual components are able to talk to one another. Um, contract testing is an approach that tries to give you an answer to that same question, uh, but in a different way. And it's different in two, uh, from the traditional approach to integration and end-to-end -end testing in two ways. Um, first of all, it focuses not on the integration of all of the individual consumer and provider pairs, but it focuses on, uh, sorry, it doesn't focus on the integration of everything at once, but it focuses on the integration of individual pairs of consumers and providers. So instead of trying to figure out are A, B, C, and D able to talk to one another? Um, contract testing focuses on is A able to talk to B? Is B able to talk to C? And is B able to talk to D in this very hypothetical example? So um, basically it breaks down that big puzzle into smaller pieces. Um, that's one difference. The second difference is that um, traditional integration and end-to-end -end testing is synchronous, meaning both the consumer and the provider, so A and B or B and C or B and D in the diagram that you just saw, need to be in the same environment, actually talking to one another at some point in time. Um, and that, because actual requests and responses are exchanged between an actual instance of the consumer and an actual instance of the provider at some point in time. And even when you break down the puzzle in uh, that, that, that big ecosystem of consumers and providers into small, into single integrations, that still requires a lot of coordination each and every time you want to run those tests. Now, contract-based integration testing is asynchronous, meaning that both the consumer and the provider still have a role to play in integration end-to-end -end testing, of course, uh, because it's communication, it's collaboration, it's connection, um, but it's asynchronous, meaning that both the consumer and the provider can do their part of the conversation of the testing process as part of their own local development and deployment lifecycle. Meaning that you can, um, and I'm not a big fan of this word, but you can shift left or, or just do your due deal, both as a consumer and as a provider, do your part of the integration testing process really early in the process. Um, because you can do this as part of, uh, just as an extension of what you typically do when you run unit tests. So yeah, when you run your tests in isolation. And that's all because it's asynchronous. Um how this works in practice, you'll see in a moment uh, when I explain some more about this, uh, definitely also in the live demo. Um, 
it's good to know that there are a couple of different approaches to contract testing. So when people talk about contract testing, they typically immediately start talking about PACT and about consumer-driven contract testing. Um, and that's understandable because it's just uh, PACT is an absolutely brilliant library and it's uh, very powerful cross-platform. We'll talk about more. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Um, but it's Pact is a consumer-driven contract testing library. Um, and consumer-driven contract testing is only one of three different approaches to contract testing. So we have consumer-driven contract testing, where the consumer writes down their expectations about the behavior of the provider in a contract, gives that contract to the provider, and it's up to the provider to verify that they can meet those expectations that all of these consumers give it to them, eh, have given to them. Provider-driven contract testing is the second approach, which is basically the provider telling the consumer, this is what I do, you go figure it out. Um, you don't see a lot of people talking about provider-driven contract testing, and that makes sense because it's very, very unidirectional. There's no feedback loop. There's no conversation. It's basically just uh, very dictatorial. The provider says, well, this is what I do. And then there's a third approach to contract testing, which is called bidirectional contract testing, where both the consumer and the provider give their own version of this is what I think I should do, or this is what I expect to do, to a independent, trusted third party. And that third party checks if there are any mismatches and any potential integration issues. So uh, today I'll mostly talk about consumer-driven contract testing. If time allows, and I'm going to try and work very hard to make sure that there's enough time to have a look at that. Uh, I also want to talk about bidirectional contract testing because it's um, it has a much, much lower barrier to entry compared to consumer-driven contract testing. Uh, I won't talk about provider-driven contract testing. Um, but I just wanted to say that if you start talking about or thinking about implementing contract testing in your team, in your company, um, this should be the first question. Uh, what type of contract testing suits our context the best? Is it consumer-driven? Is it provider-driven? Or is it bidirectional? Uh, before you start uh, what I call throwing tools at problems. Because... Uh, implementing PACT and doing consumer-driven contract testing, is uh, it will give you the most uh, value, but it's also probably by a reasonable margin um, the biggest investment up front. Um, if you want to read a little bit more about uh, pros and cons for all these different, for these three different types of contract testing, uh, I wrote them down on my blog uh, a while ago, uh, just so I would have something to point people to when they come to this question. Um, so by all means, uh, have a look at this. Um, I'm showing this slide long enough so that it actually ends up in the recording and people have the time to write that down or to copy that. Um, but let's talk about consumer-driven contract testing or CDCT. Um, as I said, it's a technique that formalizes the expectations that consumers have about the behavior of providers in contracts and provides the tools to automatically check that the providers meet these expectations. Um, it, the, the biggest benefit for providers is that they can develop a refactor without fear because they've got the contract, so they know what the consumers expect of them. And uh, so as long as they can meet those expectations, they can pretty much do whatever they want, complete code rewrite, using different frameworks, whatever, doesn't really matter. Um, and for consumers, it's a great way to build and retain trust in the providers. So uh, they know that they keep working because the consumers can see, oh, the provider is still able to meet all of the expectations that I wrote down about their behavior in my contract. Um, there's two major tools out there. I mentioned Pact already, which is also the library that we're going to see in the demo. Um, the biggest benefit, I think, of Pact is that it's cross-platform, which means that it, uh, bindings are available for... Ruby, Java, JavaScript, C Sharp, Go, PHP, Python, and probably a couple more. 
uh but these are the major ones um and uh, the nice thing is you can also uh, verify that um, the packed specification is platform independent, which means that uh, if your consumer is written in C-sharp and your provider is written in Python, for example, you can use packed um, because the contract is programming language independent. Um, the other big CD, uh, the other popular consumer driven contract testing tool out there is Spring Cloud Contract, which I haven't used myself. It's probably a fantastic tool. I don't know. Um, but its biggest limitation, I think, is, is that it's tie uh, that it's Java only, and more specifically, it's it's very much part of the Spring ecosystem. So it's probably very usable if all of your services are Spring based. Um, but if you've got something that's built in a different technology, you're not going to be able to use Spring Cloud Contract. So that's why for this demo, um, we're going to take a look at PACT. Um, how PACT works is you write tests to generate the contracts. So those tests do two things on the consumer side. They A, check that uh, of course, that your consumer implementation works as expected, but they also generate a contract. Packed from that contract generates a mock provider, uh, which behaves exactly as the consumer would expect it to. So it returns mock responses, uh, which you can then use to test the implementation of the consumer. So you get that for free. Um, the most important thing, of course, is that that contract is being generated, which can then be passed on to the provider. And on the provider side, PACT will generate a mock consumer, replay all the interactions that are written down in the contract, and verify that the actual responses returned by the actual provider are ma match the expectations that the consumer wrote down in the contract. Um, so what the flow looks like, um, because we also need a mechanism to distribute the contracts, to manage the contracts, to version the contracts, and to store and um, distribute verification results. Um, and you typically do that with a pack broker. Um, and the pack broker comes in two flavors. Uh, you have an OED, there's an open source one that's just a Docker image that that's available um, for absolutely nothing, for free. It's open source. You can uh, host it any way you want. Um, and the other flavor is Packed Flow, which is what you're going to see in the demo. Um, why Packed Flow for me? Because it's it's cloud-based, so it's just, it's just an endpoint. It's just the URL and everything else is taken care of. Um, what I'm going to show you is Pactflow. It's a commercial product, but I'm using the free plan. So everything I'm doing with Pactflow in this demo, you can do too without paying a single penny and without even having to supply your credit card details. That's just a little disclaimer that I want to give. So um, the way consumer the different contract testing works is that the consumer generates and publishes a contract um, the provider then downloads the contract and verifies compliance, uploads the verification results, publishes the verification results, and then both the consumer and the provider, as part of their own development and deployment lifecycle pipeline, can use a tool uh, that's also in the PACT ecosystem that's called Can I Deploy to check whether or not there are any known integration issues. Um, do, 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 do. let's have a look at the code and see how this works in practice. Now that we've got the theory, the theory behind us, let me uh, go away. No, this let's, of course, everything starts with the consumer. So I've got some consumer tests here for one of the two of the two consumers with some expectations about how the provider should behave um, when I retrieve an address. So I've got three different situations. Either I'm retrieving an address and it exists 
in the provider database, I'm retrieving an address and it doesn't exist, or I supply an incorrectly formatted address ID. So in that, in that case, I expect an HTTP 400, a bad request. Uh, in case of a non-existent address ID, I expect a 404, obviously. And in case of an existing address ID, I've got some more expectations. So I expect that the HTTP status code is 200, but I also expect the response to contain certain fields. Um, and those fields should have uh, a specific shape. The values for those fields should have a specific shape, meaning a specific data type, or they should match a specific regular expression. Um, it's very tempting to say they also should have a specific value, but that's crossing the line from, again, um, keep in mind that we're doing integration testing here. We're testing, can these two services, can consumer and provider talk to one another? Um, if you say, well, I expect when I input address ID one, two, three, I expect the state to be Oklahoma, something like that. Um, that's testing the implementation of the provider. That's something that should be, have been done by um, the provider, the, the, the address provider development team. That should not be part, that's typically not something that should be part of your contract of your integration test. The only thing I'm interested in is, is it returning a string? Is it returning a state field with a string value? Um, so that's what I'm writing down here. So I expect an ID field, which should be a UUID, which means um, it should be a string that matches a specific regular expression. Um, and all other fields should either be a string or an integer. So if I run the tests on the consumer side, uh, and there's also some tests for HTTP deletes, by the way. So of course it's going to download all kinds of stuff, um, but it's compiling and it's going to run the tests now. Hopefully it's a little bit slower than I hoped, which is always the case when we do this stuff live. But there we go. Um, it's still pretty quick because it's all uh, tests at the unit level. So it's generating a mock provider. So there's no actual HTTP calls being done. It's all very much local. Um, so the tests pass, which means that, A, we now know that the consumer implementation still works because we've unit tested it. Um, and a contract has been generated that typically ends up in the target packs folder, which contains the identification of the consumer, the identification of the provider, and also one, two, three, four, five interactions. So three parts for the HTTP get, and there's also two for the delete, which means five. So um, this is the most interesting one, valid existing address ID, which contains matching rules for all of the fields, which basically it says the address type should match the example here on type. And for the ID field, which is the most interesting one here, is it, uh, um, the value that is returned by the address provider should match this specific regular expression, which is a regular expression that matches a UUID. Um, the next thing is I am going to publish that contract to my Pact broker, which I've got here. So this is Pactflow. At the moment, there's no integrations yet, so it's completely empty. But after my contract has been published and I do a refresh, I can see that there's one integration here, um, meaning one contract. Uh, uh, from the uh, a contract between the customer consumer and the address provider. So a contract is always um, a set of expectations or an agreement between a single consumer and a single provider, which means that because we've got two consumers here and one provider, there's going to be two contracts. So I'm going to do the exact same thing for the other consumer, for the order consumer. So running the tests first, which 
again, checks the implementation of the order consumer and generates the contract with the expectations that the order consumer has about the behavior of the address provider. And I'm going to publish that as well. There we go. Refresh again. So I now have two integrations, two contracts that, of course, are as of yet unverified. So both the consumers have uploaded their contract with the expectations. And I can even have a look at the all of the interactions with the expected responses, all the details. Um, so, and all of the matching rules. So all the information that is in the contract is available in the packed broker as well. Um, so the consumers have done their part. They've generated the contract, published the contract. So now it's time to have a look at the address provider. Um, so the, what I'm going to do is uh, run the tests in here, which spins up an actual Spring Boot service. Uh, my service is still Spring Boot, even though I'm using Pact. That's perfectly possible. I am going to do some setup and I'm going to verify all the interactions in all of the contracts, basically. And I'm going to um, tell it what kind of specific setup it needs to do for any specific interaction. So in this case, there's all of these methods are empty. So there's no specific setup needed for any of the tests, any of the integrations. But if there is, you can do that. And you can run that code right here. So uh, with a single command, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell Pact on the provider side to download the contracts from the broker, replay all the interactions in all of the contracts against an actual running instance of the provider and publish the verification results back to the broker. So, um, what? A, oops, not there. Here, clean. And it's a bit of an arcane command. Uh, pack .verif. So by default, it go away so I can actually see what I'm typing. Uh, by default, it doesn't publish the results. Uh, so you can do a dry run before you publish back results to the broker, but I'm going to live a little bit dangerously and immediately publish the results. Uh, I'm also need to manually specify what provider version I'm using is. So because a contract is actually tied and contract verification results are actually tied to specific versions of a provider. Uh, the version one zero zero. Yep, that looks good. So again, what I'm doing by running this test is it downloads the contracts, replays all the interactions against the provider, and then publishes the verification results back to back to the pack broker. And again, this is all local within the development environment of the provider. So it doesn't need an actual instance of the consumer because everything that the consumer wants is written down in the contract. Awesome. And if, no, if I refresh a broker here, I can go back to the overview. I can see that all expectations, both for the customer consumer and the address provider are um, passing, which means that there are no integration issues. Uh, but for example, when I change an expectation, so for example, say I want to also support non-integer zip code. So I say, well, I'm now expecting the zip code to be a string. Let's see if I explicitly verify that in here. No. And that's going to be version 110 of the consumer. If I run the tests again, these tests will, if all goes well, still pass because 
Um, the expectations are different, but Pact will generate a mock provider based on the expectations. So that it will still, the customer tests will still fail, uh, pass, sorry, um, because it's not replayed against an actual provider. So, and if I publish this new contract, So what if now it has, say, for example, a, a um, the customer consumer evolves uh, because all systems and services and components are continuously evolving. And maybe the expectations change because now, for example, they also want to support zip codes in Canada and not just the US. And Canada zip codes have uh, alphanumerical characters as well. They have letters in them. Um, if I do a refresh... I can see that I've not for consumer version 110, I've now got an unverified contract. If I look at the matrix, uh, I can actually see a um, an overview of consumer version and provider version and the verification results. So this tells me consumer version 100 is compatible with provider version 100. Uh, but when I This is where command history is really nice. So I haven't changed the implementation of the provider. Um, so the provider, so the consumer has different expectations. The provider is not aware of them because, well, communication or lack of it. Um, so it now has an updated contract, pulls that in, and now all of a sudden the actual provider implementation will because it will still return because i know because i built it it will still return a zip code in integer format which is not what the customer consumer expects so as you can see there's one failure but and i published the results already if i do a refresh again um, for the order consumer, still, everything is awesome. But for the integration between the customer consumer and the address provider, we've now got a problem between consumer version 110 and provider's version 100. Um, so this is just a very quick demonstration of how... Um, into consumer driven contract testing can help you find these integration issues. Uh, and again, both consumer and both uh, the part that the consumer plays and the part the provider plays can all be done as part of the local development and deployment life cycle. It's the contract and the packed broker that pretty much glues everything together. Um, and this information, this matrix is what's actually going to be queried by the can I deploy tool just before you try and put something into production. It checks that matrix and see, well, if I want to deploy this version of a consumer or this version of a provider, are there any known integration issues between it and everything that's in production, right? And all the versions that are in production right now. Um, all of the code that you've seen, you can check it out for yourself. You can um, clone it from GitHub. This is also the code that I use a lot in actual hands-on workshops, uh, which is where we do all of this and more uh, with actual exercises. So um, yeah. Um, so again, consumer-driven contract testing is one of three approaches. Um, what it does not do very well, first of all, it's uh, not meant to test the implementation details of a provider. Again, um, that's the responsibility of the provider development team. They should have covered that themselves. It's about testing, can consumer and provider talk to one another? Uh, consumer-driven contract testing or any type of contract testing is 
not a good way to test implementation details or business logic for a provider. It's also horrible for testing public APIs because um, as a consumer of a public API, I can give a contract to that provider, make a contract available for that, that provider API, but the chances are that they're going to listen to it or even going to use it is, is pretty much zero. Um, it's also uh, typically, uh, in general, it's it's quite hard to get provider teams on board with consumer-driven contract testing because now suddenly it's all of these consumers that have expectations and want to communicate and have all of their... So it's a lot of work for the providers. Um, and the, the, the final thing is what makes adoption of consumer-driven contract testing pretty hard in some teams, in some contexts, contexts is... Um, it's hard to get testers on board because um, as you probably have seen from the code, it is uh, pretty closely tied to the code. Uh, pretty what people call low level or technical or whatever you want to call it, um, which for a lot of testers is uh, a big step. Um, it's something that definitely can be done. I am hopefully an example of that um but it's uh it's a big step for a lot of testers in 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 uh, actually un a understanding what contract testing actually is and b being able to implement it that you need you definitely need some development skills to do that um the pack team also wrote down a number of other situations and reasons where packed works and pack doesn't work um, one of the possible, so I've, I know, uh, Manu, I've got seven minutes. I'm going to very quickly talk about bidirectional contracts. Uh, big disclaimer up front: this is only supported by Packflow, not by the open source Pack Broker. And again, Packflow is a commercial product. Um, but bidirectional contract testing is a different approach to. Is it basically just a different flow? So. Uh, before, this is the consumer-driven contract testing flow where the consumer generates and publishes a contract and it's up to the provider to download it, verify it, and basically prove I am able to do this. Um, with bidirectional contract testing, both the consumer and the provider generate and publish their own contract. And it's the broker that does the compatibility check. So that's not the responsibility of the provider. It's not the responsibility of the consumer. It's being done by the broker, by an independent, trusted third party. Um, and then um, both after that's being done, both consumer and provider can check for compatibility results just as they could when practicing consumer-driven contract testing. Um, let me quickly check out... Go. So in this example, so I'm switching to a different branch. In this example, uh, I'm introducing no, a fourth, um, uh, a fourth uh, player into the field, which is a payment provider, which is a public, a very very public API. So, um, come on. Uh, Maven, where are you? It's not being recognized as a Maven. Projects, reloads. I need, uh, it's just waking up IntelliJ. Um, so this payment provider is being consumed by the order consumer. Um, and now, in, uh, but the payment provider is a public API, so traditional consumer-driven contract testing will not work. Uh, but the payment provider has its own contract in the form of an open API specification. So that's a form uh, of a provider contract. Um, on the consumer side, the consumer contract, again, by directional contract testing, uh, both consumer and a provider upload their own contract, which are then matched and checked for compatibility by the broker, by Packflow. Um, on the order consumer side, I could have just used packed again. Um, 
But there's a different way. There are other ways to generate a consumer side contract. For example, one of the one of the many examples is I can generate that from Wiremock stubs. So Wiremock is an HTTP mocking tool. Um, and I can extend that with what's called the Wiremock pack generator. So I'm not using packed anymore. Uh, so you can do bidirectional contract testing without packed. Um, the only thing I need is a, a Wiremock pack generator, which is a listener uh, that you can add to Wiremock because that those Wiremock definitions will already have expectations about how the provider is expected to behave built into the actual mocks that you define. So what the pack generator does is when you execute the tests, so... And this could be tests that are written by testers, by test engineers, by SDETs, by whatever you want to call them. And so they write tests that just use a mock for the payment service because I don't want to make actual payments each and every time I run a test. Um, and what this uh, YMOC pack generator does is it listens to requests and responses and that are... Uh, triggered, executed during the test, and it generates a contract out of that. So if I go to the order consumer again and run the tests, a contract, a consumer side contract will be generated by the YMOC pack generator without me having to use PACT. And these are tests that are much uh, that the typical tester, test engineer, test automation engineer is much more familiar with, much more comfortable with uh, to write them. So it's still going to generate contracts for the integration with the address provider, but also another contract for the integration between the order consumer and the payment provider, which means that when it's done, I now have two contracts here. And if I publish those, they will both be published to my broker. I am aware of the time, uh, Manoj. I am definitely in the wrapping up stage. Perfect. No worries. So, and I refresh here. I have yet another integration, again, between the order consumer and the payment provider. So the consumer contract is now published. It's just waiting for uh, a matching provider contract, which I'm going to upload here simply by posting, or in this case, rather putting uh, the contract, which is basically just a base64 encoded version of um, the open API specification um, to my um to my pack broker to my packed flow instance and i'm passing in identification for the uh, the provider name and the provider version and when i run this test it's still building it's a bit again it's a bit slow but it's getting there it usually only is slow when I try to broadcast something with Zoom for reasons. So this looks pretty good. Green check mark, yay. So this is just a bit of just a short code to make that API. I could have done this with Postman or any other HTTP client. Um, but I like rest short because it's easy to read. Um, I've now also published the provider contract, which means that if I refresh. Once again, I can see that for this integration, there's also no problems. And I've now used a consumer contract that's generated based on interactions uh, against the Wiremock instance. And my provider contract is simply my open API specification. And if I check the verification results, I can see that my consumer contract is some interactions generated during the execution of the tests. And my provider contract is simply my open API specification. And Pactflow has not found any potential 
integration issues here. Uh, one more minute, and then we get to the Q&A. Um, so I've got a couple of which I'm probably just going to skip. Oh, that's quick. Um, so bidirectional contracts is, again, a, um, a different way of approaching contract testing. It does not need packed. It does require packed flow, though. Um, it's more lightweight because provider contracts will typically already be there and consumer contracts can be written using PACT but can also be generated based off of existing integration tests that use mocks, for example. So there's support for Wiremock, there's support for Wiremock.net and there's support for a lot of other types of tools really, uh, which can be used to generate these contracts. Uh, I don't have a complete list. Please check the packed documentation if you want to find out because things are changing by the week and new things are added to the ecosystem by the week. Um, the downside of bidirectional contract testing is that the actual comparisons that are being done by the broker are uh, a little bit more coarse-grained. So you and where with consumer-driven contract testing, you can be very, very, very specific about, um, I want this value to be in there and I want the, uh, this element to be in there and I want the value to match this regular expression or I want an array with minimum this and maximum this number of elements. Um, you cannot really do that with bidirectional contract testing or rather at Packflow cannot really do that because it goes by what is being generated or what is in the contracts. Um, so it's typically restricted to matching by, um, is an element actually there? And does the type match what the the other half, uh, the, does the, uh, the type match what the other half wants or what the other half um, actually um, provides? So it's a bit more coarse grained, but it's also it's easier to get started with, really. Um, having said that, we've got a couple of minutes for Q and A. I can see in the top of my screen in the chat in the Q and A that there are some questions. So, um, Manoj, do you want to go through them, or shall I do that myself? I'm sure I can help you pick few questions. Yes. Um, I want to firstly pick up the question from uh, Chamat Navin, since you are in the flow with all the demos and hands-on. So the question more like seems to be, you know, sharing some sample data and asking questions around that. Um, so yeah, I mean, if you could take a look on Chamat Navin, I hope everyone in the attendee section can look at the Q and A. Uh, there is some sample uh, data and the request and the response. Yes. So Chamat asks if this only can be used for HTTP gets or for all other types of interactions. Um, it works for all other. So I've got examples in the code base for a get and a delete, but it works um, uh, pretty much the same for post puts and um, all other often used HTTP verbs, really. So um yes it works for all other types of interactions as well perfect i hope that answered your question when um, so to... i'm reading to the bottom of it. it's a it's a fairly long yeah, question yeah. <laughs> my question can we use contract test code for both api or api request validation um you can i'm not sure if it's a really good idea I, I think, again, making sure that your consumer, uh, just as making sure that the provider meets the expectations that the provider team has is part of the responsibilities of the provider team, I think making sure that the consumer actually outputs what they say they output or what they think they output is the responsibility of the consumer team. So I wouldn't use contract testing to do this. I would do this in another type of testing that's being done within the team that's responsible for the, for developing the consumers. But you you technically you could do it. Is it a good idea? I don't think so. Got it. Um, let me pick some other question. 
Let's speak. Most of them anonymous. are by anonymous attendees. <laughs> yes, exactly. I couldn't name they them. They were very active. <laughs> um, let's take this. In our past projects, we have heavily invested in specific tooling for integration testing. How can we integrate contract testing with tools like Pact without sidelining our existing investments? Um, again, it's something you do on top of other types of testing instead, and it 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 should not. Um, it, it's not meant to replace, uh, for example, functional API. It depends on, okay, so at some point, um, it's probably safe to remove some of the, uh, the more expensive end-to-end -end and integration testing uh, and replace them with contract tests. Because if the point of your integration tests is to make sure that uh, is to ensure that different components are able to communicate with one another. Uh, that's exactly the type of question that contract testing tries to answer. So if you have other less efficient tests that are also meant to find that information, get that answer, um, you could replace them with more efficient contract tests, which again is a different technique to answer the same questions about um, how are we, uh, can these consumers and providers talk to one another? Correct. Right. A slightly related one, Bas, um, from Yao Pontus, probably the only person with the actual name. Um, is it possible to use Pact Broker only with Pact, not the commercial one? Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. So um, for uh, consumer driven contract testing, the open source Pact Broker and Pact Flow are functionally. Now, not equivalent, but you can do everything I did except for except for the bidirectional testing thing. Uh, you can do with the open source pack broker as well. Um, there's pros and cons to that, of course. So where the open source pack broker is a little bit more limited is in things like um, authorization, role-based access control, those kinds of things. Uh, and you need to host it yourself. Um, but the consumer driven contract testing flow, as I demonstrated it, including had uh, the use of, can I deploy to figure out, hey, is this safe to deploy? You can do that with the open source pack broker just as well. Absolutely. Um, the only thing that I've shown that is limited to packed flow is the bidirectional contract testing, because that's supported only by packed flow and not by the open source pack broker. All right, thanks, Bas. Probably we'll take a lot, last question since we got a minute. Uh, There's a question from Madhu Singh. Um, what are the limitations of contract testing? I think it's a very broad question, I understand. Uh, Bas, you've got a vast experience around um, the integration testing, especially around contract testing. So is there anything that you would wanna you know, conclude uh, by sharing your insights on what are some of the edge cases that people should be aware of when dealing with such contract testing? Because I'm sure you agree that there is lots of individual tests that we try to write for each of those microservices. So things like orchestrating all of this in the environment and then on top of it mocking, a lot of this might get lost uh, to keep track of things. So please touch upon. Um, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't call it limitations. It's more like things that you need to be aware of before you start implementing this is that especially consumer driven contract testing, it's a lot of work. Um, it can, it, it's a great, it, it, the information that it provides is super valuable. Um, and once you get it going, it's actually pretty efficient, but getting there is, um, a long journey. It's not just pulling packed off the shelf or importing it into your project, writing some tests and you're done because you need to get, um, different teams on board, different departments on board. You need to get the provider teams on board, especially. So what I typically recommend is if you start doing this, start doing this in a team that's responsible for at least both the consumer and the provider part for a specific integration, because then you, and you're still doing proper contract testing, but you don't have the additional complexity of doing it across teams because that's typically just a little bit harder. So you can show 
uh, that's that's a relatively quick way of showing the added value that contract testing can bring without showering all different kinds of different teams and departments with a lot of complexity if you don't even know that contract testing is actually going to solve the problems that you've got if that makes sense absolutely thank you so much Paz. i'm afraid we might have to leave other questions out but i'll be happy to send over these questions to you on linkedin and then um, um we do have a Yes, could you, I'm going to share my screen just once again. Um, could you please, I'm not that active on LinkedIn at the moment. So it's going to take me a while to, uh, email works way, way, way better. Um, that's also an invitation to everybody of you who attended the session today. If you've got any additional questions or feedback, I'd love to take them. Just the most efficient way to get in touch with me is email at the moment. So my email address is on here, as is my website. Uh, I blog right on contract testing pretty regularly over there, as well as on all, the, all things testing, automation, conferences, whatever. Um, I just want to quickly thank you. I'm sure Manoj will do a quick wrap up as well, but I want to thank you for taking the time out of your day or evening to attend the session. I very much appreciate it. I had a lot of fun doing this. Um, and thanks to you too, Monash, and the team at Lambda Test for having me. I, I love doing these things and I appreciate the invitation. Absolutely, Bas. We love doing this as well. And we are more than happy to, happy or honored to have you as a speaker. And this was the 11th edition of Voice of Community uh, in, that's happening in September. 2023 and we will have many more such sessions in the future but um, I'm sure this was one of a very different session uh, we're just having a chat with my team and they were sharing the same that you know it's, it's not quite often we get to see um, such an interactive demo and contract testing um, which what the very much most of the enterprises are trying to do so thank you so much Bas for giving an opportunity um, to you know um, share your wisdom to some of our attendees and um uh, the best way to reach out to you is email. Thank you for sharing that. Yes. And uh, and we usually start up a thread in the community. So we have something called Lambda Test Community. And I'll send that link to you over as well. So you can keep yes, uh, please. track of I that. Yes, please. I will do. I will do that. Perfect. Absolutely. Thank you so much, everyone. And um, if you're interested, we already finalized the next speaker uh, for the October edition of Voice of Community. I'll just paste the below uh, link down in the chat section. So please go ahead and register for yourselves and um, I'll see you in the next month. Till then, take care and thank you so much everyone for joining and best thank you to you. Thank you all. Bye-bye.